Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 20th. Today, we celebrate the beloved botanist who served on Captain Cook's third South Seas trip. We'll also learn about the Austrian botanist and monk who pioneered the study of heredity. We'll recognize the usefulness of daylilies, and we honor the life of a young man who was killed paying his florist bill, and the life of a garden writer who wrote for the New Yorker. We'll hear some poems that highlight the garden as a sanctuary, a holy place to heal and be refreshed. And we grow that garden library with a book about gardening in your front yard. It's packed with ideas and projects for big and small spaces. And it's an idea that's gaining popularity and acceptance thanks to stay-at-home orders and physical distancing. It's one of the positive effects of dealing with the pandemic. And then we'll wrap things up by remembering Catherine Stewart and the people who loved her most. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world in today's Curated News. First up is a post from Barbara Quitten of Warren, New Jersey, and she writes, Hi Jennifer, I enjoy your show. Here's a photo of my side garden in full bloom. This garden used to be full of hostas, but the combination of homes being built and loss of habitat created a salad bar for the deer. I needed to replace the hostas with deer-resistant plants and came up with the combination of flowers in the photo. The hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies agree. Well, Barbara's photo is an example of what I like to call smart gardening. She's removed all of the beautiful hosta that she no doubt loved. We all love hosta. But it's no fun to watch your hosta get eaten by deer. And so what she's done instead is she's made these very thoughtful selections. She's got echinacea for color. She's got a couple of different varieties in there. She also features a plant called red hot poker with the Latin name Nyphophia uveria. And if you've never grown them, red hot poker are sun-loving perennials. They are tough. They are deer resistant, and you get this amazing tall spike of red, yellow, or bicolored flowers. And they start blooming right about now in July, and they'll continue on through late summer. And Barbara's right, these plants are a definite hit with all kinds of pollinators. You're going to get butterflies and hummingbirds for sure if you plant red hot poker. And not only is this plant deer resistant, but it's also rabbit resistant. The two tend to go together. And another aspect of the red hot poker plant that I really appreciate is the fact that it's pretty tall. They can grow to be about three feet tall. Now, I do have one word of advice if you do decide to grow red hot poker, and that is not to cut it back. You want to let the foliage be. These plants go into a dormant period for winter. The foliage, of course, during this time isn't that attractive. It kind of yellows like a daffodil does. But that foliage is still doing work. It's still providing that solar canopy, gathering nutrients from the sun and giving the plant enough food so that it can come back next year and be glorious yet again. Now, another plant that Barbara has in the back of her garden is butterfly bush, or Budlia davidii. Butterfly bush are also another wonderful deer-resistant selection. They look beautiful when they're in the back of a border like they are in Barbara's garden, And they also are really pretty planted along the edge of a forest. So they're a marvelous transition plant. Now, what I love about butterfly bush is that they're so attractive all year long. They have a naturally beautiful shape and foliage, so they're pretty even when they're not blooming. And like the red hot poker, these plants are tough. They're plants of steel, And the only thing I would tell you to be careful about with butterfly bush is making sure that you're growing it in the right zone. 
because these plants have a hardiness zone of five through nine in the United States. And I have seen so many Minnesota gardeners growing in zone four or zone three who see a beautiful butterfly bush on sale at the store and then buy it only to have their heart crushed when it doesn't come back the next year. So if you see butterfly bush at the store, and you might, just know you're going to have to see that as an annual this year if you're growing below zone five. But they really are a beautiful, beautiful shrub. And they're definitely a magnet for pollinators, which is no doubt how it got the common name of butterfly bush. Well, thanks for that share, Barbara. That was fantastic and such a great example of smart gardening. Now, if you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greeting segment, just send your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to me at my email, jennifer at thedailygardener.org or jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And you can also share your greetings in the Facebook group for the show. Here's today's curated news. Today's curated article comes from Gardenista, and the title of the post is Unconventional Wisdom, Eight Revolutionary Ideas for Your Garden, from Thomas Rayner. Here is an excerpt. When you meet landscape architect Thomas Rayner, he comes across as a pleasant, mild-mannered fellow, not at all the type to be traveling around the world as he does, spouting revolutionary ideas calculated to upend years and years of conventional gardening wisdom. As he writes in his preface to Planting in a Post-Wild World, one of my favorite books, a book that he wrote in 2015 with Claudia West, his ideas come from his time as a boy in suburban Birmingham, Alabama, where he spent countless happy hours roaming a stretch of indigenous Piedmont forest near his home. Now, you can read this post in detail and find out all of Thomas's earth-friendly garden advice that he says produces better results with less work. But the way this post is structured is it's a list of do's and don'ts. And I'm going to go through the headlines, and then hopefully they arouse enough curiosity that you actually seek out this post and read what Thomas says about these items. So if any of these kind of strike a chord with you or you disagree with them, definitely track down this post and read it and understand why Thomas feels the way he does about these categories. Okay, I'm going to roll through all eight with you really quick right here. First is amending the soil. Thomas says, don't. Double digging, that's number two. It's another don't from Thomas. Number three is soil testing. This one gets a yes. This is a do. Definitely soil test. Number four is mulching. Thomas says don't. If you want to find out why he says that, check out the post. Number five is planting cover crops. This one is a do. In fact, many of you know that I am staying up at the cabin during the pandemic. I'm not back at home in Maple Grove, and so a lot of my garden beds are not getting tended to. But before I left, I did plant cover crops in those raised beds. So I was glad to see this on Thomas's list. Number six is curbside planting. That's a do. Number seven, here's one that I think we can all agree with, buy a lot of plants. Do, that's a definite do. And then number eight, experimenting and having fun. Also another do. We should definitely be doing that. Which reminds me, especially during the dog days, that I want to encourage you to have some time in your garden where you're not just working, where you're not working all the time. Because I really hope that you're having some fun out there, that you're enjoying your time out there, whether it's by yourself or with your family or some friends. Safely, of course. 
And you know, one of the ways that we can do this as gardeners is we have to create little islands or areas where we will have fun. You know, up here at the cabin, we have these two giant oak trees that are in the middle of our property, and they're about 10 feet apart, and they were perfect for a hammock. So that was one of the first things we did when we bought this place. In fact, I think we had a hammock outside in between those trees before I even had a couch in the house to sit on. And that hammock gets so much use, which is one of the things I love about it. That's exactly what I wanted. And there is nothing that makes me happier than looking out the window and finding one of my kids just hanging out on the hammock by themselves. Now, granted, they probably have their cell phones with them, but I know that they're looking at the sky. They're looking at this magnificent canopy of oak leaves. They're hearing the loons and the geese and the ducks. And there's no doubt in my mind they're seeing all of the flowers in the garden. They can't miss them. They have to walk right by it. So that's one island that I have for relaxing and having fun in the garden. But the other one is kind of unexpected. And it was the creation of this very large eight foot potting bench that my son Will helped me build. I mentioned this on a couple of previous episodes. I managed to get the cedar lumber from a woman who was selling her cedar railing from her deck that she no longer wanted. And I got all of this beautiful cedar for $60. It was a steal. And then together, Will and I created this potting bench. Now, I'll be honest, when I had the idea to create this, I was thinking about work. I was not thinking about fun. I was thinking about all of the things that I need to do outside. And I was trying to create for myself a little workspace. But what has ended up happening is it has become not only a little workshop, but I'm starting to transform it into an outdoor room. Now, I'll share pictures of this in an upcoming blog post. But another reason why I'm so excited to share this with you is that if you're one of these people that has been longing for a garden shed and you realize that that is just not going to happen for whatever reason, then an outdoor potting bench could just be the ticket for you. You know, when we bought this place, there was a shed in the backyard, and I have so longed to want to transform that into my she shed. But the reality is, it's small and it's dark, there's no lighting and no windows. And of course, the mice love it, which makes me not want to spend so much time there. I'm always afraid when I open the door, what's going to be in the shed? But not so much with this outdoor potting bench. I have the blue sky and the beautiful pine trees as my ceiling. I have the forest floor as my carpet. And now I'm enclosing this area by adding some privet and hydrangea, some beautiful ferns, and of course, some hosta. And I'm creating this garden room. And I have to tell you, it is just so fun to hang out there. And yes, I do some work in that space. I'm definitely grooming all of the houseplants that I have outside. And I'm prepping my plants and shrubs before they go into the ground. But I am also having just an absolute blast using that space as a place to create and relax and just enjoy gathering up all of my garden miscellany. I'm organizing my pots. I'm styling my plants. I'm finally using this rustic garden bench that I've never sat on before. And it's now got the cutest little cushion and outdoor pillows on it. And it's my little piece of heaven among the pines on the northwest side of the house. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated article from Gardenista, the one that featured Thomas Rayner, all you have to do is search for the word Thomas in the Facebook group for the show, and that post will pop right up. And then my original blog post for today about having more fun in your garden will also be in the group as well. And so if you're ever listening to the show, 
and you hear something and you want to read more about it, you're in luck because I do share all of it for free in the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the anniversary of the death of the British botanist David Nelson, who died on this day in 1789. David served as the botanist on Captain Cook's third South Seas trip. William Bly was the sailing master. After gathering many new specimens, David spent the bulk of his time caring for over 500 breadfruit plants that Bly was transporting to the West Indies. Breadfruit is a reference to the texture of the cooked fruit, which is similar to freshly baked bread. And breadfruit, by the way, tastes like potato. A likable fellow, David had traveled on another expedition with Captain Charles Clerk of the ship Discovery, who said David was one of the quietest fellows in nature. As you might recall, the Captain Cook expedition suffered a mutiny on April 28th 1789. For his protection, David was kept below deck and under guard. But David eventually decided to go with William Bly and his followers to Timor. The 3,500 mile voyage was grueling, and he died on this day, just 54 days after the mutiny. David's death was a blow to Bly and his crew. And to honor this mild man of botany, Bly conferred full naval honors for his funeral service. Three years later, Captain Bly visited Tasmania, and he named Nelson's Hill the highest point on the island in David's honor. Today, Mount Nelson is the Hobart location of Tasmania University. And today is the birthday of the Austrian botanist and monk Gregor Mendel, who was born on this day in 1822. Gregor discovered the basic principles of heredity through his experiments with peas in his garden at the Augustinian monastery that he lived in at Brno in the Czech Republic. Or, as I like to tell my kids, Gregor learned about heredity when he gave peas a chance. Sorry, couldn't resist. During a seven-year period in the mid-1800s, Gregor grew nearly 30,000 pea plants, and he took note of everything, their height, their shape, and color, and his work resulted in what we now know as the laws of heredity, and to this day, Most kids study it in school. And it was Gregor who came up with all of the genetic terms and terminology for heredity that we still use today, like dominant and recessive genes. And it was on this day in 1960 that the Chicago Tribune ran an article about the daylily, saying that they were tops in usefulness. Here are some highlights. They wrote, because they combine exquisite charm with extreme hardiness, daylilies are without a doubt nature's most useful flower. And I love what it says here. They wrote, their usefulness derives from their ability to thrive lustily under virtually any circumstances, which makes them particularly adaptable to so-called problem areas where the gardener may have experienced difficulty growing other flowers. And they added, for the weekend gardener, with a large piece of land to work, daylilies are the answer for far corners which never get attended to. And then they add this bonus, the abundant foliage of the daylily will keep the area free from weeds, too. Nice bonus. 
And it was on this day in 1974 that the IRA murdered Brian Shaw. Brian was just 21 years old when he was killed. He was a former soldier and a truck driver, and he had just married a girl from Belfast. Two weeks after their wedding, Brian disappeared when he went to pay the florist bill for flowers that the couple had used at their wedding. And poignantly, the bill was still in his pocket when his body was found. And today is the anniversary of the death of the garden writer and one of my favorites, Catherine White. She died on this day in 1977. Now, Catherine was married to Andy, but most of us probably know him as E.B. White, the author of three beloved children's books, Stuart Little, which was written in 1945, Charlotte's Web, which came out in 1952, and The Trumpet of the Swan, which came out in 1970. In the early 1930s, Catherine and Andy bought a farmhouse in North Brooklyn, Maine. By the end of the decade, they left their place in New York for good, and they moved to the farmhouse permanently. And it was Catherine White who once wrote, From December to March, there are, for many of us, three gardens. The garden outdoors, the garden of pots and bowls in the house, and the garden of the mind's eye. One of my favorite quotes. Catherine began writing garden pieces for The New Yorker in 1958. And in 1979, her only book, Onward and Upward in the Garden, was edited and published posthumously by Andy. Gardeners especially enjoy Andy's tenderly written preface to his gardener wife. Anatole Broyard gushed about Catherine's book, saying, It is itself a bouquet, the final blooming of an extraordinary sensibility. Now, Catherine carried on marvelous correspondence with another garden writer, Elizabeth Lawrence. And their letters convey a warmth and a curiosity that I thought you would find delightful. Here's one that Catherine wrote to Elizabeth on July 2nd, 1958. Dear Miss Lawrence, I'm in New York for the moment, so it was on my desk here at the New Yorker that I found today your book, The Little Bulbs. Already I have dipped into it with delight. I shall carry it back with me to Maine next week and study it and consult it for years. The varieties of bulbs I have established are the obvious ones, I'm afraid. The two colors of scylla, snowdrops, snowflakes, crocuses, white and blue grape hyacinths, and among the small tulips, only Clusiana and Kaufmanniana. Your book will help me to expand, I hope. The following June, she wrote again, Here I am, back with another question, in spite of my promises. Do you know the address of John de Graff, and does de Graff bring out a catalog? I have been studying the lily offerings for autumn of this year, and every one of them, both in specialist catalogs and in those of the big nurseries, of course, brags of the lilies from the great de Graff. And then listen to her postscript, and bear in mind this was June 15th. She wrote, It's 48 degrees here today, and it has been this for 48 hours. Discouraging. Later that October, she wrote, Dear Elizabeth, speaking of gourds, for the first time my small decorative gourds did not mature in time for me to wax and polish them while watching the World Series. I am a baseball fan, I hate to confess, and I have loved baseball since I was a child. And here's a sample of one of Elizabeth's reply letters. This one was written in November of 1959. She wrote, Dear Catherine, I don't know anything about modern flowers that have lost their fragrance. I think some hybrid roses are as sweet as the old ones. 
At the fall flower show, I was intoxicated by the scent of one flower of Sutter's Gold. And how in the world do you accomplish all you do? I have been interrupted five times since I came to my desk an hour ago, the last by a friend who wouldn't take the plants I offered on a day I was in the garden and would like to have them right now. I told her to come on. If she doesn't, she will choose a still worse time. Aren't those letters magnificent? Well, you can read all of their correspondence in this marvelous book. It's one of my favorites. And it's called Two Gardeners, Catherine S. White and Elizabeth Lawrence, A Friendship in Letters. And it was written by Emily Herring Wilson. And of course, you can use the Amazon link in today's show notes to buy it. And there are used copies available for under $4. Now, after Catherine died, her husband Andy sent a little verse that he had written to their close friends and family, and I found it very touching. It said simply, To all who loved my lovely wife, to all who spoke their sorrow, I send this printed card of thanks so I can face tomorrow. I'd hope to write a full reply to each to say, I love you. But I'll reveal the sticky truth. There's just too many of you. In Unearthed Words, here are some inspiring verses that highlight the garden as a sanctuary, a holy place to heal and be refreshed. This first one's from Robert Frost, the American poet in a poem called God's Garden. God made a beauteous garden with lovely flowers strewn, but one straight, narrow pathway that was not overgrown. And to this beauteous garden, he brought mankind to live and said, To you, my children, these lovely flowers I give. Prune ye my vines and fig trees, with care my flowers tend, but keep the pathway open, your home is at the end. This next one's from the American poet R. H. Swanee. If words are seeds, let flowers grow from your mouth, not weeds. If hearts are gardens, Plant those flowers in the chest of the ones who exist around you. And finally, here's a poem from the American essayist and poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. For flowers that bloom about our feet, for tender grass so fresh, so sweet, for song of bird and hum and bee, for all things fair we hear or see. Father in heaven, we thank thee. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Shrubs by Andy Mackendo. This book came out in February of 2019, and the subtitle is Discover the Perfect Plant for Every Place in Your Garden. Gardens Illustrated said this about Andy's book. Mackendo is a devoted and knowledgeable ambassador for shrubs. His advice is clear, practical, and honest. The sort of counsel every gardener needs. This book will be an invaluable addition, not only to the bookcases of gardeners, but also to those garden designers seeking to broaden their plant palette. This is one of my favorite books on shrubs, and it's 337 pages of fabulous photos and detailed shrub profiles, and it's all shared with today's gardener in mind. You can get a copy of Shrubs by Andy Mackendo and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $14. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. 
Well, after researching Catherine White, I discovered some touching correspondence that occurred between her husband, Andy, and her friend and fellow garden writer, Elizabeth Lawrence. In July of 1979, Elizabeth wrote to Andy about Catherine's book after she had died. She wrote, Dear Andy, thank you for having the publisher send me Onward and Upward. It really is. I've been rereading and rereading ever since with great pleasure and great sorrow. I cannot bear not being able to tell Catherine what a wonderful book she wrote. I'm writing to ask for permission to quote a paragraph from a letter you wrote to me a while ago. You wrote, Catherine just spent three days in bed in pain caused by a back injury brought on by leaning far out over a flower bed to pick one spring bloom, the Daffodil Supreme. It seems a heavy price to pay for one small flower. But when she is in her garden, she is always out of control. I do not look for any change, despite her promises. I'm not sure about your species, whether it is the Daffodil Supreme or the Daffodil Supreme Rinveld, but I don't think it likely that any reader will know the difference. I thought the paragraph fits in with your loving introduction to Catherine's book. I'm having a miserable time trying to say something worthy of the book in the space allotted to me. Affectionately, Elizabeth. On March 24, 1980, Andy concluded a letter back to Elizabeth with these words. Tired snow still lays about here and there in the brown fields, and my house will never look the same again since the death of a big elm that overhung it. Nevertheless, I manfully planted, as a replacement, a young elm. It is all of five and a half feet high. By Catherine's grave, I planted an oak. This is its second winter in the cemetery, her third. Yours, Andy. Five years later, Andy died at home in Maine, and he's buried next to Catherine in the Brooklyn Cemetery. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.